make some notes about uh, shock waves. Then uh, I will come to the implementation, how to get running such a setup like um, an instrument, uh, like organ pipes, into a computer. We'll show some results and, and a summary and an out outlook. Here are some um, horrible examples uh, for shock waves. Shock waves um, that are waves that move faster than the local speed um, of sound and fluid. Here are some uh, military ex uh, examples, so nuclear weapons and conventional uh, weapons. You may know these um, pictures. Or shock therapy in medicine to shape up the body or to uh, also used in medicine or for uh, break up some gallstones, for instance. Uh, some much more beautiful example is probably this. Here's some uh, shock waves in a numerical simulation. I will speak about this. Uh, so shock waves in an organ pipe, just to show here this is uh, the pressure and you can see uh, the shock which is traveling back and forth here, up and down, and the so uh, sound field is generated. <clears throat> it's also uh, uh, observed in brass instruments, trombones, etc. And here in, in an organ pipe, one can see in the initial process, um, yeah, we have some uh, input, some reflections, and uh, and we, what we can see is also dispersion. Uh, it's like a, a spring, uh, the system of shocks. And this brings me to our scientific question. Um, do shock waves contribute uh, to sound generation in the transient process? And if, why, uh, how do they do this? And to answer this question, we utilized uh, numerical si uh, simulations. Um, just to give you a sketch of the fluid mechanical problem, uh, what we have to simulate uh, is uh, sound generation, of course, uh, sound propagation from the first physical principles. Uh, that means that we have a compressible and inhomogeneous problem. Um, here in the organ pipe, you know, we have a turbulent jet, so we have to we have a turbulent problem. Probably we have a coupling between wind field and acoustic field, of course we have. And then um, we should, uh, we have also sound propagation in a waveguide and uh, propagation into the free space. This leads us to solve the compressible Navier-Stokes equation and this is still a very advanced task to do that. And here is uh, yeah, a recipe to, to a successful implementation. Uh, at first, of course, you have to know or have to write down the constitu uh, constitutive equations, um, take care about uh, some fluid mechanical characteristic numbers, um, Look for Kolmogorov scales. These are scales um, which define the dissipation into the thermodynamical continuum, which means in our case, in a numerical case, uh, which energy transfer you have into the subgrid scales. Then uh, you have to write proper mesh, of course. Uh, thermodynamic dynamical properties boundary and initial conditions. The operators uh, uh, you have in this uh, uh, Navier-Stokes equation, you have to discretize Nabla operator, Laplacian, and so on. Uh -huh. Then uh, probably a turbulence model is uh, useful uh, to design. And uh, if you have these things, then um, uh, you should parallelize uh, the system, uh, your, your calculation, because it's uh, 
typically a very uh, advanced calculation. Here, for instance, for this, uh, I will show you. Uh, I used the cluster uh, at the University of Hamburg. Uh, I calculated on 256 CPUs. It takes about a week to, to do this uh, calculation. And the post-processing, um, if all data are created, about a terabyte, then uh, you have to visualize it probably, or you have to sample some data uh, to analyze. So here, the scientific work starts. Okay, here are the constitutive equations. We have six field variables, uh, the density, the uh, velocity vector, the pressure field, the temperature field, equation of continuity, the momentum balance, also known as the compressor de Navier-Stokes equation, and an energy equation. Um, yeah, just to show, here are some uh, fluid mechanical characteristic numbers. Um, most important probably for the system are Reynolds numbers, which define do I have a la laminar problem or a turbulent uh, setup? Here in this case, it is a weekly uh, turbulent setup. Um, that means we have to use a turbulent model. The Kolmogorov scales are calculated here. These uh, scales are important to f get an idea what are <coughs> the grid size and the time resolution of the problem, and it depends on the amount of computer source you have. Uh, if you only a personal computer, then uh, your grid size cannot be so large. If you uh, have a, an account to a, such a big cluster, then your, your calculation can be a little bit more advanced. We decided to <coughs> use uh, a 2D model, not a 3D model, because a 3D model still uh, is uh, not realizable in, at the moment. Uh, it takes too much time. And so here is the picture again. One can see uh, some transverse reflections here. And I show you this picture because I come to my results. What we can see are, uh, is the jet flow. Uh, that's a fluid dynamic uh, or wind field, if you want. And then uh, a shock or a wave fronts that propagate uh, outside and inside the uh, waveguide. And you see some reflections. And I call these shock wave fronts. Uh, and to analyze these uh, fronts, uh, I sampled uh, a cross section through the resonator called CS resonator. And here is uh, the L spectrum of this sampled data set. You can see uh, the, the upper picture is uh, the whole numerical uh, uh, time setup. Uh, you can see a very nice uh, fundamental frequency and the higher harmonics. And here at the end, this uh, uh, picture below are the, yeah, the range of the transient. And here you can see some quite high frequencies. And these are these reflecting uh, waves with high frequency, which we uh, identify with these shock waves. And the question is, are these shock waves or are these not shock waves? Um, here you can see uh, the, uh, a plot where the time, uh, the time uh, evolution of these uh, first or this initial uh, uh, pressure fluctuation, the propagation of this initial uh, pressure fluctuation is shown. First, the first wave front, more, much, more or less linear, linearly. And if you see, uh, look to the second and the third one, <coughs> you can see these are faster than the first one. And that means that uh, 
these uh, fronts accrue. Well, they come up to uh, accruing. Uh, if we analyze this, um, we can uh, uh, calculate the speed of the first shock. It's a little bit her, uh, higher than the speed of sound with uh, 363 meter per second. And the second and the third uh, shock are even faster than the first shock with uh, 408 and 400. Uh, 57 meter per second. That means that we have um, uh, different um, velocities of the shocks. Uh, they accrue, and uh, at the beginning, we have also a linear, uh, non-linear behavior of uh, shocks. Second observation is that we have. Uh, damped amplitudes of these shock waves uh, and this damping uh, is are, uh, can be fitted by power laws. The first uh, shock here by minus 0 0.6, the second one minus uh, 0 0.5 and the third shock uh, 0 0.4. So what can we learn from this? Um, here you can see the color-coded time evolution of the cross-section, CS resonator. This uh, point is uh, the point at the lower resonator, and the upper uh, point is uh, the end of the resonator. And you can see here, the first shock is traveling to the upper end, it's reflecting, comes back, and so on. And what you can see is uh, the shock is surviving up to, well, up to eight uh, milliseconds, first one. And after a while, a sound field is uh, developing, uh, is, is established. So if we look a little bit more in detail, the first uh, two milliseconds, uh, we can see a little bit more. Here uh, you can see these uh, reflections uh, of the second and third um, shocks. And yeah, here we can see these multiple uh, reflections. And after the reflection at the upper end, the reflections are doubled, of course. Uh, all these reflections come up to the end and reflect, and so it has to double. And you can count this, here are the different first days, then 16, and so on, and so on. And what we see is this is the way uh, how the sound field is created by the shock waves. Our second observation is the delay between the first shock and the establishing uh, sound field. Uh, for instance, yeah, you can see it very, very good. The phase uh, velocities are different. We have a delay. Uh, the shocks are faster than the, uh, uh, the generated sound field. Only at some uh, points, here it's all part uh, three milliseconds, and at nine, uh, eight times nine milliseconds, we have in-phase uh, points here. They are marked, and at this in-phase point, uh, points uh, the system uh, or the energy transfer from the shock wave into the sound field is uh, very large. Yeah? So the third observation is. The shock triggers our sound field at special points, at in-phase points, and at these points the shock dissipates piecewise its energy into the sound field. Here you can see the setup 
uh, cross section again. At first, a lot of uh, shock waves are uh, traveling back and forth. And you can see the first shock is surviving, and the other gives their energy up into the uh, what we call the linear or the, the modes we know, the linear uh, from the linear wave uh, theory. Um, here is, uh, or here was, the first in phase point. And you see, after the first in phase point, almost all uh, higher shocks are dissipated into the sound field. And if you look to, uh, to the next point, 8.9, uh, then all shocks are gone and the sound field is established and the mode, the pressure uh, is oscillating with uh, the harmonics and you can also see then the higher harmonics now. At the lower end here, with the resonator, a vortex uh, is rotating, we call it the primary vortex. This is the nonlinear system uh, we have to look in future work. So uh, we can see um, our transient process is up to nine milliseconds, and after this, the sound field is created. Then the working process is beginning. At real organ pipes, this transient process uh, is three times longer. So why is it? It is why because in a real organ pipe, the attack time of, uh, of uh, this, uh, the, uh, this process is much more smooth. Uh, we have not a perfect shock wave coming into the system in this amplitude, in this, with this high amplitude. This is a more smooth process. Um, and that's why we took this simulation to see the, yeah, the basic principles uh, behind this sound generation, or this transient process. S sometimes you have to make some, yeah, much, a well, little bit unrealistic uh, uh, assumptions to, to look what really happens. So, my summary uh, is here, shock waves and the transient play a key role uh, in sound generation of organ pipes. What we have seen that the shock, first shock propagates um, radial uh, with a constant speed, and the third and uh, second and third uh, shocks uh, propagate faster, and they're changing its k vector, its uh, uh, wave vector, if uh, you remember. Then we have a nonlinear damping in amplitudes of these shocks. Um, what we could see with this uh, numerical approach is uh, that the shock waves constitute the sound field and uh, via this uh, yeah, working title, uh, the peak doubling caused by uh, superposition and reflection. And what we can see is that uh, the first shock this is the shock we survive, uh, uh, triggers the sound field at uh, some points, uh, the in-phase points, we call this, and the energy dissipation is piecewise into this sound field. Yeah, the outlook is uh, what are the role of these turbulent coherent objects, uh, for instance, the Z, uh, the Z is oscillating here, and forth, and this vortex structure and yeah what is what are, uh, are the role of these turbulent coherent objects in this instrument uh, we know that uh, if this uh, oscillation of the jet is not perfectly or you can um, uh, you can manage this uh, this oscillation via uh, some uh, work at the labium and so on. It's very uh, sensible to, to, to this. Uh, organ builders know that. So th the question is, what's the role of these turbulent coherent objects? 
And this brings me to the end of the talk. Thank you very much.